Burnley. Now for Jacobs again. Hit across the echo. Bannister's header. And there it is, another one. Parsons playing a long ball forward. Warboys is onside. Is this going to be his hat trick? It is. Well, now, little Bruce Bannister, the cheeky chappy from Bradford, always provided a slick line in putter to go with his goal snatching. Uh, nowadays, back in Yorkshire, he's managing director of a firm selling sports shoes. Now, big Alan Warboys, the minor son from Goldthorpe in Yorkshire, was a strong, straightforward, old-fashioned centre forward. And nowadays, instead of pulling in those crowds, Alan pulls pints, running a village pub back home in Yorkshire. Together, though, they were the little and large of West Country sport. Alan, I hear he's still calling you big enough after all these years. Has he, has he changed in any other way? No, <laughs> not changed at all. He's still the same. He's uh, still one of the lads, and he'll never alter. Bruce is straight down to earth, which I like him for. He's just absolute one of the lads. Straight down to earth, he calls you, but of course you were... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about you were always You always seemed to be prodding him to be successfully in the old days. It seemed to work, this you're, you prodding him and him responding. Well, I had to do all his thinking for him, you see. <laughs> in love with that but um, obviously we enjoyed the time down here at Bristol very much so yeah. one of our most successful times and uh, this is going to be a little musing session for us did it help both coming from Yorkshire Alan um, I don't know it's it's a so funny how it, it, it they brought us together and how it went it, it was absolutely unbelievable it, it just clicked off straight away. It just, it just came, just like that. Indeed, that was the case, because uh, down among the uh, fading photographs and the yellowing cuttings, the partnership of Bannister and Warboys is one of the great memories which uh, shines through. There is Warboys standing behind Stanton. It's going to be touched to him, I imagine, and then a big bang. Here it goes. It's there. Smith in charge of operations to Warboys. It's a good shot, and it's a goal! A brilliant goal by Bruce Bannister. An example of sheer intuition, as you'll see now. Will Smith rolls it sideways. Warboys hits a cracker, and Lil Bannister with exquisite timing. Lil Fleck and it's Bristol Rovers 1. Bristol City nil. what a sensational start. Burnley. Going well, he's got space. Goal! Number two for Alan Warboys. Five minutes from time. The crowd field up puts the seal on it. Warboys nodding it down for Bannister. Back to Warboys. He lets it go. It's there. It's a very good goal. Warboys nodded it down to Bannister. Bannister got it back to Warboys. And Warboys drummed it into the net with that powerful left foot for his 15th goal of the season. Some examples there of that tremendous goal scoring partnership. Now, Bruce, who was the, the governor, or was there no governor? Just played well, it off the cup. There wasn't cup. really. Um, Big Allen had the. Uh, uh, well, how could I put it? He, his legs took him where he went sometimes. That's, that's a nice bit of English, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But. Um, he needed to be up, up the middle, really, to fight out with the big fellas. And if you could get him doing that, he was a good player, a very, very good player. And um, we were able to do that. And, of course, he was the ideal partner for you, wasn't he? Because he was always lurking around, picking up the things that your bludgeoning created. Exactly, Roger. Um, in the, the ones we've just seen there, the goals that Bruce has got, he was always in the six-yard box, never out of it. That was his strength. And... Um, it showed with the goals we got. I was there, I knocked him down, and wherever I was, he was always two or three yards. He knew full well if I wasn't going to win it, the other fellow wasn't going to win it, and the ball could drop within a few yards of, he, of me or the, or the central defender. And really there he was. I was always putting his mistakes right, you see. <laughs> Alan Warboys started off at Doncaster as a schoolboy, then at 19 went to Sheffield Wednesday and promotion to the first division. He was seldom out of the headlines and was being acclaimed as a possible future England centre forward. And a familiar face in that Sheffield team, Don Megson, the man who was to become the manager of Bristol Rovers and in due course bring Alan Warboys to Eastville. Then came for Alan three years at Cardiff City. They paid 
£45,000 for him, big money in those days, then followed a brief six-month spell with Sheffield United before that final move to Eastville. Now, Bruce Bannister had arrived 18 months before Alan. He'd left uh, grammar school, age 17, and signed for Bradford City, spending nearly six years with them before finally being lured down to the southwest. Bruce Bannister's 61 goals for his home side, Bradford City, caught Rover's eye in 1971, so they signed him for £23,000. He seemed as surprised as anybody. Basically, I, when I first came down, to be honest, I came down for the experience. I've never, I'm a Bradford boy. I've never been away from uh, Bradford. I've never been involved uh, in a transfer deal before. So I thought I needed the experience. I didn't really think I was going to sign, but uh, Mr. Dodgin talked and talked. And he'd done ever so well, you know, and I was very impressed with him. Rovers were to pass from Bill Dodgin to Don Megson. Since 1962, they'd been down in Division Three, but now success was coming. Alan's going to talk and talk and talk about your, hey, the old sideboards and the kipper ties, eh? He wore that suit last night. <laughs> <laughs> still got it, he wore it last night. Yeah. Don't tell him. What was your first uh, feelings on coming south? You know, you've been a Bradford lad all your life then. You know, young I wasn't boy. worried about that. I didn't really want to join um, a third division side. But as I said, Bill did talk, talk, and he's a football purist, Bill. And there were some very, very good players down yes. here. Wayne Jones, Harold Jarman, Brian Godfrey. Um, well, I know that uh, you reckon that one of the highlights uh, was when Rovers were to win that Watney Cup, remember? The Watney Cup, that was a pre-season competition. In the 1972 final match, third division Rovers against first division Sheffield United, England's Tony Curry and all. Played in hot August sunshine, Eastful was packed. 19,000 there, and to get this far, Rovers had had to get past second division Burnley and first division Wolves, and they'd done so without conceding a single goal. The game itself proved both sides had good defences. It was to be nil all after extra time, and so it became a penalty shootout in that searing heat. Rovers goalkeeper Dick Shepherd was to dive again and again in trying to prevent Sheffield stealing one equaliser after another. So it was to come down to sudden death, and it was Shepherd who was to make the vital save from Sheffield's Ted Hemsley. Yes, he'd done it. Rovers had won the cup, seven goals to six, and Eastville went the same. Alan not involved in that Watney Cup. He was yet to arrive, and Alan, as we saw, your old teammate up at Sheffield Wednesday, had put on the team manager's blazer now at Bristol Rovers, and Don Megson bought you for £35,000 in 1973, and almost immediately the special chemistry of smash and grab was to become a major factor in the club's promotion. That was really a big day. When Rovers at last won promotion to the second division in 1974, it was a personal triumph for Bruce Bannister and Alan Warboys because between them they scored 43 goals. But they were always careful to point out the glory of promotion belonged to the whole team. In the euphoria of that spring evening, the talk in Bristol was of Rovers going on to the first division, led, of course, by smash and grab. Alan, they were wonderful days in Bristol, that, that promotion season. What do you remember especially about those days going up to Div 2? Um... Well, the biggest thing was the crowds and the people that were there, the faces that were there, and the joy of it all. At the end of everything, it was absolutely marvellous. You know, when you've been involved in something like that in a, in a long season, and then you get to that stage, and you, it, it, it is a great relief, and it's a marvellous re relief. Smash and Grab had really taken off now, Bruce. It was becoming known nationally. Did you ever think of, uh, you know, marketing it in any way, the two of you? No, not really. It, it took off um, really with uh, uh, a situation that happened at Brighton, I think. And uh, from there, it, it just got bigger and bigger. Indeed, it was, it was in fact, that uh, Brighton match in December 1973 was to, that was to be the game that everyone really remembers Smash and Grab for. And the one that you've joined us in many ways, especially to see. Uh, Brian Clough had just taken over at Brighton when Rovers arrived on a bright winter's afternoon. And so it's a goal kick to uh, Bristol Rovers. This is Jim Eady, man who won the on-the-ball safe-keeping title last season. 687 minutes without being beaten. Spirit rather buffeting Bannister there. And now it's Dobson, virtually with his first touch. And Warboys now being chased by Norman Gall. 
And Gaul was quite clearly holding him back, and this is a goal! Yes! Scored by Bannister. And Bristol Rovers in the lead with four minutes gone. Bruce Bannister, the scorer, with a good run down the left by War Boys. He held off Norman Gaul, crossed it in, and it could either have been the number seven Fernley or Bannister who got the touch. Finally, it was Bannister, though, and that makes Bristol Rovers 1 0 ahead. Another throw for Brighton. O'Sullivan, Robertson, played in the game for George Lay, and Taylor once more getting it away to Warboys. Bannister once more to Warboys, and Dobson in a lot of space down the left. Here's Dobson. And three Rovers players up wanting the ball, and there's number seven, Fernley, and that's number two, a beautiful goal. Beautiful breakaway by Bristol Rovers. With Brighton once again all over the place. Played beautifully across the field to Dobson, who was again making beautiful strides down the left. Three players again were in position in the middle, and it was Fernley's header that tucks it wide of Powney. 2 0. No comment needed there. Nice little payoff there to O'Sullivan. Wanting perhaps a little too much time, but then getting in his shot. right foot and having got it there put it wide of Jim Eady and that makes it 2-1 O'Sullivan losing it to Jacobs Warboys turned on for Fernley controlled beautifully there by Gordon Fernley now for Jacobs again hit across that goal Bannister's header and there it is another one so as a variation they worked it down the right with Trevor Jacobs, the number two, linking up well with that attack. The cross hit low. And Bannister turning it in. And Don Megson in the centre, a man who's done so much for Bristol football. Must be very relieved indeed. Stanton now behind this free kick, Tom Stanton. And Warboys, just three men in that uh, Brighton and Hove Albion wall. Number nine is Warboys. Number eight coming to the picture is Stanton. It's Warboys who hits it. And this is going to be the next one. And it's the hat trick for Bruce Bannister. A beautifully hit free kick. Fumbled there by Powney. And Bannister, a simple job of tapping it in to give himself a hat trick in 31 minutes. And he Beamish to O'Sullivan for Brighton. Taylor away. Here's Bannister once more. And again, Warboys right in there as his ally. Played off this time for Stanton. Completely missed his kick. Prince instead. Dobson on the far side in a lot of space. Curling it through once more. There's Warboys! Number five! Unbelievable stuff here by Bristol Rovers. Five goals away from home. And still only 38 minutes gone. And Warboys meeting that cross from uh, Dobson, beautifully picking his spot in the corner. 5-1. It was a marvellous day, that. It, I can remember the, the game vividly, but now it's brought it all back. It's, it, it's marvellous. You were saying that you, you had, in fact, looked at the pitch in the morning and thought they won't play. That's right. We'd, I remember get, getting up, and as a normal thing, we used to get up, take the skips, and go down, just a few of the lads, go down to the ground and put the kit out, and just sit about and I was stood on the terrace and the referee come along and he's walking about on the pitch, normal type of thing and I thought well he's never going to play this and he walked off the pitch he says yeah it'll be alright we're playing yeah, well, I just it's... couldn't believe it yeah, in fact as we saw one or two people slipping about but Rovers kept their feet and did they really take it out on Brighton let's enjoy some more of that one Rovers throw, Colin Dobson with it Bannister back again for Dobson so he might beat Templeman on the turn here. Did very well indeed, and it was the fists of the way there. Only as far as Stanton, and another magnificent save there by Powney. First of all, a good punch, and then as Stanton cracked in the return, somehow Powney got across and turned it away once more. Tremendous shot there by uh, Stanton, Tom Stanton. 
Warboys played for Dobson. And here's Bannister off once more. I think he was half looking for a penalty there, but uh, he looked in vain. Prince again. Spirit. Straight to Dobson. And into the path now of Warboys. This will be the number six, I would think, and it is! A real smash and grab again. Where Dobson and then Bannister between them. Bannister's final pass to Warboys round the goalkeeper. And that's 6-1. Oh, the fans who've come up from Bristol have got plenty to celebrate going back. Well, the uh, young Clough sons have something to smile about. I don't think Dad's got too much to smile about, though. Simon and Nigel Clough. Howe turned towards Hilton. But Taylor quite easily being able to nod that one away. He must tower a good seven or eight inches above uh, Hilton. Stanton, the uh, Bristol Rovers player, in a bit of trouble on the far side, just getting to his feet now. Parsons playing a long ball forward. Warboys is onside. Is this going to be his hat trick? It is! That's number seven for Bristol Rovers. The long run from just inside the Brighton half. And Warboys cracking it with a great sureness. Left footed. His hat trick and Bristol Rovers seven. Stanton, spirit away to Beamish, O'Sullivan, Towner. No, stopped again by Taylor, or rather by Green. And here's Warboys onside, the linesman's kept his flag down, and that's his fourth goal. And Bristol Rovers eighth. I think Brighton felt there was a little bit of offside about it, but the linesman on this side of the field, directly in line, kept his flag down, waved Warboys on, and Warboys tucked it past Pownie for the eighth time this afternoon, and for the fourth time that he's done it. A long, 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 long time since we've had an away win of this magnitude. And I'll give you that score once again in case you can't believe it either. Brighton 1, Bristol Rovers 8. Well, in fact, it ended up 8-2. They got another one. Alan, you got four there, four goals. Uh, how do you explain such a wonderful day for you two out of such adverse circumstances, a dodgy pitch? It was just one of them days and everything went right for us. Um, we was getting breaks and the ball was going in the net. And you get some games where you get more chances than that. And you just can't finish them. But on the day that day, the, f the chances went in. The we combination between well. you two was obvious there, Bruce. One can see that you are reading each other's intentions. Yet I believe off the field, you were totally different. I mean, he'd be up early looking at the pitch. You were still in bed, weren't you? What, what was to go on on match mornings, you two? <laughs> Not a lot. Uh, <laughs> I think what that does show, though, is that uh, it wasn't just Big Alan and myself. It was uh, a team event. Yes, indeed. And um, that really was the greatness of that side. But it was a very, very good team. And we were the sharp end of it, I accept that. But uh, it was a very, very good team. Indeed. Seven goals between you, though. Someday, uh, what vibes did you get from the great Mr Clough about it all afterwards? Can you remember anything? Well, he, was, he, he's, whew, he was awful to his own team, as it happens. He re I mean, arguably, justifiably, but he really, really slagged the, uh, his, his own players off. Something awful, wasn't it? Oh, I uh, and I thought it was a disgrace, personally. Terrible. Really? Yeah. But you know, that perhaps is the man. That's how he motivates it's people. The biggest, course, yeah. biggest thing I remember after the game, I came off, and as you can see from the game itself, I had a cut eye. Yes. So I, I went in the treatment room, and I'm waiting for the doctor to come along and put a couple of stitches in. He walks in, Cluffy, and he says, uh, what you been doing, lad? I says, well, I says, I've got a knock playing. He says, it must have been self-inflicted, like, because we haven't seen none of our defenders all afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> it was such an extraordinary day, just let's treat ourselves to another quick look. 
And Gaul was quite clearly holding him back, and this is a goal! Yes! Scored by Bannister! And three Rovers players up, wanting the ball, and there's number seven, Fernley! And that's number two, a beautiful goal! Controlled beautifully there by Gordon Fernley. Now for Jacobs again, hit across that goal, Bannister's header, and there it is, another one! Number nine is Warboys. Number eight coming to the picture is Stanton. It's Warboys who hits it. And this is going to be the next one. And it's the hat trick for Bruce Bannister. Curling it through once more. There's Warboys. Number five. Straight to Dobson. And into the path now of Warboys. This will be the number six, I would think. And it is. Warboys is on side. Is this going to be his hat trick? It is. He's onside, the linesman's kept his flag down, and that's his fourth goal, and Bristol Rovers eighth. OK, Bruce, a wonderful example of a goal-scoring partnership, but to what extent did you boys uh, practice the sort of things that brought you such success? We practiced a lot together. We knew set pieces, um, but really it was just something that... It was mutual strengths. Um, my strength is picking off the big fella, and the big fella's strength was getting up there amongst it and making it happen. Alan, so, you moved around a lot, you had several clubs. I doubt you ever had such an ideal partner as uh, the little fella. No, that was um, the partnership we created in, in it, Eastville. It was, uh, it was great. And the atmosphere that it created within the club was also good. But the, the partnership, I, I've never had one like it. It just clicked from the word go. It just took off and took off. Were you, in fact, close off the pitch? Um, Family-wise, very close. The, the families got on terrific together. There were always the two wives and the kids were always off somewhere together doing something. So we'd got a, a very good tie off the pitch as well. Bruce, I always got the impression from you, you loved goal scoring. It was the proof that you were good at your job. And you were a little fella and you had to get goals to prove it in a way. Anything in that? Yeah, I think that's a fair comment. That's how I looked at it. It's a matter of um, trying to hit targets all the while. And that's how I look at any job that I'm doing. Alan, you've uh, run a pub now. Um, do you miss the uh, the roar of the crowd and the, oh, the hitting the back of the net, man? The roar of the crowd, the back of the net. Um, them days, um, I'll never forget. But I do miss them tremendously because I finished with a, a back injury, and I still felt that if I hadn't got the injury, I could have still been playing. Um, this is Peter Pan. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Pan, <laughs> definitely. But as I say, Roger, I, I do miss the roar of the crowd. It's something all players will miss when they have to finish but it's part and partial that no some stage or other we're gonna have to finish when you look back on your career and when you look back on your days with alan in that team uh, what are the uh, we obviously the the brighton matches are highlight as a match but what are the things that you remember and you miss now when you wake up in the morning and go to the office the thing i miss most is the physical activity quite honestly the business of being out in the fresh air um and working the body that's basically what I miss. And Alan, what about you? I mean, you came down here as a Yorkshire lad, you ran into another Yorkshire lad, you had a magic partnership, you became known all over the whole country. What will you remember Bristol as? Bristol had four marvellous years of my life, and they really were good years. I came down in November, and I had an overnight stay here, but the people and have just changed now, they're different, and, but the, the times when I was here, when me and Bruce were here, they were marvellous years. Marvellous we're characters in, in marvelous sports. Marvellous in every, marvelous. In every way. Support-wise, off the field, um, the players themselves. We had a terrific club at that time. And, and the four years were, were terrific. Well, it's great to hear that you enjoyed your time here so much. Uh, certainly here in Bristol, uh, Warboys and Bannister will always be remembered as smash and grab, and particularly for that uh, wonderful winter's day at Brighton. Uh, Alan and Bruce, good to see you both again. And you, Roger. Mm.